Everyone is welcome here, no matter who you are, no matter where you are on your life's journey. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. How many of you heard that and thought, yeah? My life has been like that. I know what that feels like. How many times have we rushed home from work and eaten dinner standing up in the kitchen and then rushed off to the next thing, whether that's a, a meeting, meetings, lots of meetings, or the kids' soccer game or some other commitment? How many of us have eaten lunch at our desks or out of a vending machine? How many of us sit down for breakfast anymore, except maybe we're sitting in the car? Or maybe we don't even eat breakfast. How often are our meals arriving in a paper bag? Seems to be a standard part of postmodern life to be so busy that we can't even sit down to have a meal ourselves, let alone eat a meal with our families or our friends or our coworkers. A few years ago, uh, UCLA's Center on Everyday Lives of Families published uh, the results of an anthropological study that they had conducted in the early 2000s. It's called Life at Home in the 21st Century, and it's a study that followed 32 middle-class families in the Los Angeles area. These brave study participants opened their homes and lives to the anthropologists and researchers took over 20,000 photographs of homes and recorded over 1,500 hours of home tours and interviews and family interactions, which gave a fascinating and, well, sometimes frightening look into modern family life. Now, the anthropologists were interested in the material culture of the family. That's what anthropologists study, after all. And the study reveals a lot about how our relationship to stuff affects our lives. And then the other thing that the study revealed is what our stuff and how we deal with it says about the busyness of our lives. So here's an example of one of the photos from the study. Something that might look familiar to you, right? The very full refrigerator, not in Outside, but outside. The fridge was full too, but the outside is very full. Um, so the researchers found that there was a correlation between how cluttered the exterior of the refrigerator was and how cluttered their lives were. So the more stuff on the fridge door, the more stuff there was in the house, the more likely it was that the family members were losing the battle against limited energy, limited time, limited storage, and unlimited material goods. Another part of the study explored the family's dining habits. And the study <coughs> compares the self-reported statistics of how families eat dinner together, so what people say they do, with the actual observations that the researchers made of the families in the study. So, on the left, you have the, what U.S. families self-reported. They said that 50% of them always eat dinner together, always. But in actuality, when they studied these families, only 17% of them actually ate dinner together all the time. Um, it was more likely to be usually and then, uh, again, more of them never ate dinner together than those that self-reported. And then additionally, most of the families relied heavily on prepared foods like frozen or par-baked meals, even though the time savings was only 10 to 12 minutes. So they thought that these, that these pre-prepared meals were going to save them a lot of time over preparing everything from scratch, but it really only saved about 10 minutes per meal. And then two-thirds of families ate fragmented meals in which family members are eating at different times or even in different rooms or eating what, you know, the adults eating one thing and the kids eating something else. 
for many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. Another interesting finding that is illuminating is that the most common home renovation was to create a fancy master bedroom suite. That probably sounds kind of familiar too. And it's, they're designed to look like a cushy hotel room, you know, like a place you want to visit, not the place you live. They were supposed to be refuges of quiet, leisure away from the hustle bustle of family life. But they were hardly ever used by the family members. So this is one of the, um, one of the suites. It's lovely, and you'll notice that the, the, the picture is in slices. Each of those slices represents one photo that the researchers took when they visited. So there's probably, I don't know, 10 slices there. There's no one ever in the room. Each time the researchers came, the room was empty. So here is this beautiful refuge from the hustle and bustle of their lives, and they never take advantage of it. They're never using it. And then there was one other finding in the study that, that interested me and that I found kind of disturbing, was that the study participants rarely went outside. The lead author of the study, Jane Arnold, um, who's a professor of anthropology at UCLA, noted that something like 50 of the 64 parents in our study never stepped outside in a week. When they gave us tours of their house, they'd say, here's the backyard, I don't have time to go there. They were working a lot at home. Leisure time was spent in front of the TV or at the computer. And this was not the case just for the adults, but the children too. About half of the children spent no free time in their backyards during the study. Family rarely used their, their yards, even if they had invested in outdoor upgrades and furnishings. Uh, and they live in Southern California, where the weather is mild most of the time. So here's another composite photo. This is a backyard, and there's probably 10 slices of the yard taken over, um, over weeks or months, and there's no one in the yard. And there's a growing body of research that indicates that the direct exposure to nature is essential for healthy childhood development and for the physical and emotional health of both children and adults throughout their lives. And uh, author Richard Louvre, in his book Last Child in the Woods, coined a term for this. He calls it nature deficit disorder. And that's the harm that can happen when we don't get outside enough. Louvre suggests that as children and adults spend less of their lives in natural surroundings, their senses narrow, physiologically and psychologically. And studies indicate that time spent in nature can stimulate intelligence and creativity and can be powerful therapy for toxic stress in our lives and as prevention for such maladies as obesity and depression. So if we're already, if we've already had the feeling that our lives were too full and too overwhelming, this UCLA study certainly helps make it clear that it's not just a feeling, it's a reality. And there doesn't seem to be any easy solution or quick fix for this complex problem. It took us a century or more to develop the material culture and way of being in the world that we have that is too busy and it will take a monumental effort, a societal effort, to change it. Of course, I'm hoping that if I clean off the front of my refrigerator, my life in my house will miraculously be less cluttered. Right? Let's all try that this week. I think I'm going to do it. But one way we can start is just by heeding the words that we hear from Jesus in our passage from Mark. And this happens just after, uh, well, there's a little side story in between, but last week we read the passage from Mark where he sends out the disciples to do their work in the world. He tells them to you know, go and heal the sick and 
exercise demons. And they do, and they come back to him, and we tell him everything that they've done, and then he says, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. He recognizes that they have been busy, that they have been working hard, and that the, the work that they're doing, this work of ministry, requires them to reconnect to God, to pray, to rest, to recharge. And he's asking us to do the same. And hardly do they do that, that they get busy again, right? The crowds come back and the teaching and the preaching happens again. And so it's very important to pay attention to that one little line that reminds us that we need to take Sabbath rest. And we're familiar with the commandment to keep the Sabbath holy, but I think most of us, I know I always did, interpret that as, well, the obligation to go to church on Sunday. But it's not just about the obligation to worship God. It's also about the obligation to rest from our labors so that we're capable of meeting our obligations the rest of the week. And think about what an amazing idea having a day of rest would have been to people who had recently been slaves. What unbelievably good news it would have been told, it would have been to have been told that everyone was guaranteed a day off of work. In a way, it seems like we are hmm, a bit like those ancient Hebrews enslaved in Egypt, but our slavery is of a different sort altogether. It's often self-constructed, self-imposed, and so it's even more difficult to detect. When we find ourselves enslaved to our work, or enslaved to our schedules, or enslaved to society's notion that more is better, that bigger is better. And so in light of this, it's important to hear Jesus' invitation to come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. And it's not just an invitation to take an afternoon off or go on a vacation, although those are important actions for our health and our well-being, but it's also an invitation to create a practice a spiritual discipline of resting in the midst of our busyness. It's an invitation to carve out time for those things that strengthen our relationships with God and with each other, which can mean things like spending time in nature, spending time playing with our family or with our friends, or spending time sharing a communal meal together. And Jesus is not the only voice in the Bible telling us to rest. Here again, the opening lines of Psalm 23, and I love the way the message addresses this psalm directly to God. God, my shepherd, I don't need a thing. You have bedded me down in lush meadows. You find me quiet pools to drink from. True to your word, you let me catch my breath and send me in the right direction. 